Okay, so we're being recorded, so Gilbert and others. And we've got Gio is on the phone. It's good. Hi, Gio. Yes. How you doing? I'm pretty good. Yeah, a little bit busy in my job. So. I, I suppose. <laughs> are you able to see the screen? Um, are you on your computer? I see you're logged on on a phone. Yeah, I, I'm able to see it because I download the application, the Zoom application. It's really oh, good. Cool. So, yeah. Okay, great. That's perfect. Well, um, hopefully we can keep things um, pretty tight tonight. Uh, last night we had a ton to cover and we still managed to get done in an hour. So if we can right. you know, get a half hour, 40 minutes or so, um, I think that'll probably cover it. Um, but um, like I said, I've got the recording going. And I guess the first order of business before we <laughs> get going is um, it worked pretty well, I think, for the other group. And I hope it works for you. If we plan a meeting every two weeks just to kind of regroup and if we keep mm -hmm. them nice and short, is that work for everybody if we meet on the mm -hmm. um, November 12th date at 7 mm -hmm. o'clock? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and then, like I said, hopefully some SMEs will jump in with us. Uh, I don't see any on here yet. But um, if, if nothing else, what I'll do at the end of this call is send around an email. Um, hang on one second. I'm all twisted with my cord here. Um, I'll send around an email that um, provides you with their email addresses and then yours. And then if you do have any specific questions, um, we can maybe handle it that way if they are not able to join us tonight. Um, so let's jump right into where we're at. Um, Joe and I've had some off back channeling back and forth. Um, we did go we decided to go ahead with the OER Commons group and um, as our branded repository. Um, Joe, I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit. Um, I did speak with our contact at um, OER Commons, Mindy Bol Boland was her name. And she indicated both the microsites and the hubs come at a fee, which we aren't able to handle at this point. Um, thousands of dollars, like $8,000 to set it up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> a microsite was $50,000. So um, hopefully one day we'll get grant money and that may become a reality. But for right now, uh, it looks like we're down, going down the group path. But Joe, did you have any thoughts on that or any comments? You know, um, I didn't even think to ask, and of course they didn't tell me if there are any fees associated. I just automatically assumed that when we were just uh, conversing that, uh, that there weren't any fees associated with it, but uh, I guess I just had a, um, I just went blank and didn't really think to ask that. So. Yeah, you know, we, we were pretty far into our conversation, actually. They don't lead with it, that's for sure. <laughs> and um, I just kind of threw it out there because it was getting to be pretty, the le length of features that you get on a microsite was getting pretty long. And I was like, well, wow, why would anybody do a group if they could do a microsite? And then she said, well, the price tag is the reason why. <laughs> so, um, But then, Joe, um, any thoughts on, I know you've had been out of town this past week, but um, you did have a chance to poke around. Any thoughts that you could share with the group as far as um, the functionality of groups? And I don't know, but did you have any, a chance to talk to Mindy or was it um, just by, via the email? Yeah, I did chat with Mindy for a little bit and um, she shared some of the details with me and she, she was under the impression that she thought a hub would be our best. Um, even though the hub doesn't have the unique URL. Um, but at the same time, I thought that the, you know, all three of those options, the group, the hub, or the microsite could, you know, be some of our new um, I haven't jumped into too many details yet, but um, I did look into the adding a member and adding a, uh, an administrator, and um, I guess you have to specifically add people as administrators, um, and then they have, like, all the, all the privileges that um, administrators should have, like adding other members or, or whatever. So you have to be an administrator to add a member, from what I could tell. Okay, right. And um, did you guys get uh, an email from me? It would have come from mm -hmm. OER Commons. Okay. Yeah. So you should be able to go in there and, and play around. Mm -hmm. And um, probably the, the key things to, um, to consider with that would be um, taking a look at how the group works, like how do you actually – you know, set, get people to join it. Do we want it to be an open thing or do we want to be able to just invite people? Probably I'm thinking we want to just invite people. So if we could just all in the next week or so just, you know, poke around on that a little bit on OER Commons and see uh, how that group, group feature works. And, um, and then secondly, how the open author works, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that would be great. Um, but do you have any other thoughts on, on that, Joe, as far as um, things we should think about or, or look at? 
Uh, no, that's really about it. I mean, I, I feel like uh, anybody could be a member of the group, but I guess when we when it comes down to loading the resources in there, I guess they're going to be vetted first. So our facilitators will probably be uploading them. Does that sound correct? Yeah, I think so. Or and that's why I guess right now I've got it shut down um, just to that for that purpose that we really want the resources to be fairly and I'm using quotes that you can't see air quotes. We want them to be fairly vetted. Um, so you have to go through the MOOC and you know have have prepared them in the style guide and the format that we want before that we can open it. So right now it's locked down, and I'm assuming we'll keep it that way just so as you're saying either the facilitators or we teach the learn um, the participants how to upload their own resources so. um, and then so for the next part um, geo this is where hopefully you can help us out a little bit if you go to that um, OER Commons link that I shared and you poke around and see what other groups do most of them are pretty generic and they haven't taken the time to actually brand it to their their particular project some have like on the hubs and microsites they do so um, it would be great if you could help us um, develop like a logo and then any other type of branding type of thing you could think of, um, like a header or whatever it might be. So that whenever we talk about the adult learning zone as part of Designers for Learning, it has a presence. And it'd be great if that sort of tied into, and we don't have much of a logo necessarily for Designers for Learning, but we do tend to use black, red, and white. Um, and then anything you could think of as far as being able to create a logo that would emphasize the learning and educational focus of what we're doing. Um, so whether that be like a little graphic or, you know, whatever you could think of for that. And then in terms of um, what I'm thinking about in terms of uh, where we would post this, it would obviously be within the, the group's portion of OER Commons. And then also we have a Twitter site and um, we have a, a Google Plus site. Mm -hmm. so it would be nice to have, you know, the small square one for like an, an avatar type profile size and then something more, you know, horizontal, a little bit uh, larger to be more of a background header, something like that. Uh, for sure, definitely. Um, so you want to just take a, a crack at it and, and we'll see what you come up with or do you need more? And I, I guess I don't really have many, <laughs> many other requirements at this stage other than what I've just mentioned, but, um, you want to take a crack at it? Um, I'm, I'm going to work on, you know, some of the sketches in the logo. Okay. Um, I'm going to present to you, to you during the weekend. Is that okay for you guys? Oh yeah. Take your time. That's fine. In fact, if we, when we meet in two weeks, um, okay. that'd, that'd be fine. You know, take your time over the next couple of weeks. And, okay. Uh, no rush on that whatsoever. Um, okay, great. And, um, okay. Then, uh, next on deck is Aaron and, um, you and Gilbert have been kind of hashing out what the template and the style guide would look like. And before you <clears throat> start, and again, I hope a, a SME will join, join. Oh, there's Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Do you, you hear us? I hope so. Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry. Oh. Oh, no, no, no problem. We were, we were just kind of started out a little early, actually. Um, actually, Amanda, we're right at the point uh, where you provided us some information last night. Um, the other group was also talking about um, the, uh, the idea of the, temp the um, I'm not speaking correctly here, the, um, what the MOOC participants will be preparing. And uh, we kind of all use a bunch of different language and we're kind of saying the same things, but at times we're not. So sometimes we talk about it being <laughs> that the MOOC participants will be creating um, instructor guides or sometimes we talk about it being lesson plans and then there's the contrast to then the actual lesson materials that the, um, the GED students would actually uh, work on. And so um, Amanda suggested that we take a look at um, a website that I have listed. Let me okay. Highlight it. It's called Teal. Uh, I'll put it in the chat room. Okay. Uh, there you go. Teal.ed.gov. And it's, a, I believe, it, Amanda, maybe you could uh, do a much better job than I'm doing right now <laughs> as far as explaining to us uh, the genesis of this project. You said it was something you worked on at work and then and what, the, uh, what the reason it was created and, and how it's supposed to be used. Okay, so I didn't actually work on it, but it's an AIR project, so okay. um, I'm familiar with it. So it is, TEAL is a federal project focused on writing skills for the most part. However, um, they created um, a lesson plan. I, 
don't want, I don't know if it's called the, like a sandbox or you know something like that, but they um, the template has become really popular in adult ed because it's been around for mm -hmm. so long, and you know the projects tend to recycle it so teachers are seeing the same things over and over again. So they use the WAPIA um, lesson planning template, which is what I shared or suggested that um, folks use last night. And so, um, you know, Amanda, like we were talking last night, um, uh, it depends on, on where you spend most of your time, I guess, in the educational world. In higher ed, we don't necessarily do lesson plans, really. <laughs> you know, it's right. more of like a K-12, and it sounds like, um, I guess, they are considered lesson plans in adult ed. So how, um, let, let, maybe if I open up what we had kind of started to draft as a, um, as a template, we really, again, we're kind of con contrasting a, p a portion of the um, lesson Whatever, whatever we're calling this, let's call it for right now the template <laughs> that the students would be preparing, the MOOC participants would be preparing. It would have the lesson description, which uh, kind of sets the, the tone, gives an abstract, talks about the subject we're covering. But then um, when you scroll down, and hopefully everybody can see my screen right now, you get into then like an instructor guide where it talks about things such as the time required for the lesson, what prior knowledge and prerequisites may be required, uh, required materials and things like that. And then if you scroll down, there's a third section, which really then gets into the what I would call the guts of the lesson, where, what the student will actually be working on. So it would be the lesson activities and the materials that you'd actually go over with the, with the student. Um, so how would you say that compares and contrasts to the lessons, um, the lesson planning um, that's part of this TEAL guide? So for the, uh, the WAPIA um, lesson planning template would be what you're calling the guts. Okay. Um, and I think all of the background knowledge that you're providing ahead of time in the previous sections will be so helpful. Um, so people can just kind of get a good idea of what's involved rather than getting into the guts first. Okay. And so can you help point us to where, um, so if I go to this lesson planning site again, let me click on this again. Um, so this is the Teal site. Where would we see that WAPIA thing? The, um, can you scroll down a little bit? Sure. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's the warm up. Okay. Keep going. Sorry. And then if you keep scrolling, there should be um, a graphic um, that's really helpful. And oh. then um, I don't know if there's actually a template to fill in because they've made it um, a, a, an online piece. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, this basically spells it out, you know, what they expect, like some sort of warm up and introduction, some sort of presentation and modeling, practice, 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 uh, the teacher's own, you know, evaluation, and then the student's independent application of the new knowledge. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is pretty Gagne-esque. Okay, so it starts out with, um, okay, I like it. Okay, so does this make sense, um, Aaron? And hopefully... <laughs> I and know I we're going to get in the cart ahead of the horse a little bit. Can I have you guys jump ahead with this? But go ahead. Um. I was just going to say, I, I do have a template somewhere in my files that either I created or I found somewhere. So if you like it and you guys want to use it, mm -hmm. um, just let me know. I can just forward it. It's pretty basic, but it might be helpful. You know, and I, I did kind of let you jump in without, um, could, would you mind just giving like a 30 second introduction of who you are? And I apologize. I think we probably, we probably all met you in the first week, but you, <laughs> you can have the floor to introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, my name's Amanda Duffy. I work at the American Institutes for Research in the adult um, learning practice area. And my main role there is developing and facilitating professional development for adult ed um, teachers, professional developers, wow. and state directors. Um, but I'm also a former program administrator and classroom teacher, both ESL and ABE. Um, so and that, so that's you, me. <laughs> you spend mo a lot of time doing professional development with, um, with ABE instructors, right? So ABE and ESL, yep. That's perfect. So that's you're, that's why we're so excited to have you. Here. Yes. Yes. So, so Aaron, um, go ahead. Now, I, like I said, I, I we kind of had you started to work. You and Gilbert started to work on this before. Yes. You know, we we knew about this. I didn't. I never. And now I re understand that that WAPI or whatever is just an acronym for mm -hmm. these. Uh, the yeah. warm up introduction. I didn't even. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's cool. It's just like words we throw around. <laughs> I don't even think of it. Um. But yeah, go ahead, Aaron. 
Well, it's kind of funny that um, we've moved in this direction tonight because Gilbert and I pretty much spent last night, we talked for about an hour, really concerned that both him and I being in higher ed, even though I've worked with adult learners in higher ed, you know, they're usually, you know, completing their bachelor's degree. We really aren't familiar. We were concerned about, you know, what are the characteristics of GED learners and what did that look like? What were the interactions between the facilitators and the students? Because neither him, him or I have any experience with that. I'm always concerned about, you know, developing anything, whether it's a template or the content for the lesson without really understanding, you know, the real world experiences of the learners and the facilitators and how these interactions really work, you know, mm -hmm. how the guides are really used in, in day to day. I mean, that's something I, that is completely foreign to me. And that was both Gilbert, Gilbert's concern and my concern. So this alleviates some <laughs> of my concerns because I was just really, I mean, we were both looking at the template, not even knowing if this would be something that would be, be useful in that environment. So it's great to have somebody with, uh, you know, the level of expertise in talking. Um, I mean, I even thought maybe I would try to find a GED teacher in Cincinnati here and go talk to them and even maybe talk to a student just to get that, you know, that first person experience and kind of absorb that. So yeah, it really is helpful because I, I just kind of like feel like I was designing or we were working on something just kind of making some, you know, Assumption. working on hy hypotheticals, you know. Exactly. And just to put you at ease, everybody, I would, Amanda, you were there last night um, with our other designers. I, pretty much everybody was <laughs> agreeing they were in the same boat. Um, and so again, Amanda's just one of our um, panel of experts. And so mm -hmm. what, what I think um, has been working. This is well. a great learning experience for me. I, I mean, I'm hoping to learn a lot about a new, a new area of education and that I've not, that I have no, no experience with. So I really need to be, I mean, I need my hand held through this whole thing. So I do appreciate okay. you joining tonight. Yeah, I, I'm ready. Happy to hold your hand. <laughs> that's, that's what adult ed teachers do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've held his, I've held hands of, you know, college adult students for years, but so. So, um, and, and um, Aaron, what has seemed to be working well last night um, was the, uh, we, we again started to make these introductions between the designers and the, the SMEs mm -hmm. more, more formal, um, informally than I guess we had up to this point. And so as you're preparing things, um, they've all been very open to okay. reviewing drafts of things okay. and um, having email exchanges. So again, when okay. we're done, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure everybody has each other's emails. Um, but if do you have anything, do you want me to give you the screen? Did you have anything that you had been working on that you'd want um, uh, to talk over at this point with um with Amanda or? Well, we we that? had you we had looked at that template and we thought that there may be a few additional things that we could add. But again, you know, we're kind of grasping in the dark. You know, I'm just kind of coming out on my own experiences with adult learners at the college level, and you know, we were considering you know maybe having a a section to help facilitators, you know, understand the learners if they're not familiar with the learners and the characteristics, you know, of adult learners. But again, I'm sure those characteristics are different than the adult learners I've worked with. And, you know, I don't yeah. know what that, what that looks like, but having some sort of, you know, standard, you know, that's in, in all of the lesson plans or in all the guides that, you know, just maybe some short bullet points to to put it to put the lesson in in the context of the learner and and how to communicate best with them and to draw upon their experiences to improve the you know the overall outcomes uh -huh. um you know because we you know i developed a lot of um instructional guides for an adult learning program but it was a degree completion program in each of those you know we had two or three pages for the facilitator or the instructor just on the characteristics of adult learners and how they differ from, you know, traditional learners, you know, pedagogy versus andragogy. And that Gilbert and I thought that might be a good section to add in there, but we don't really know what, what the characteristics are in this particular, you know, space 
mm -hmm. because we're not familiar with the learners. I'm sure we could do some research, but well, why do it when we've got experts like her, you know? Yeah, I was so, going to say, don't, don't spend your time doing that research. If you just email yeah. me and tell me what you need, I will send you specific okay. documents that you can draw from. And I just um, wanted to rewind a little bit and say that I, while I'm not sure if I know teachers specifically in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. um, I have a pretty large network of okay. um, adult ed teachers that I would, that I really trust. Yeah, um, and that I would be happy to put you in touch with if, if you want that, and you could talk to them via phone or email or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just I learn best. I mean, it's nice to have survey data and stuff, but I learn best when I talk to people, and when I talk to learners and I talk to teachers, I just learn best that way. That's just how I, yeah. you know, I want to get into their first person qualitative experience and hear their hear their challenges and struggles. That's been my biggest fear is here is so far as trying to design from a lack of really knowledge or experience, you know, it's that first mistake you always make is you don't take into account who your student is and who your teachers, teachers are. And I, I feel, I think both Gilbert and I, you know, Gilbert works in a college of pharmacy. So he's working with very, you know, technical professors and students. So right. both we're, you know, I think we're, we're going to have to learn from you and from others and, and really work together and collaborate to come up with, you know, solutions. I think if we all put our heads together, we can come up with something really fantastic, but we're going to need to be led. I think at, at some point, yeah, just from what our conversation was last night, you know, mm -hmm. yes. So, um, you know, Amanda, this might be a good place to start that that discussion. I don't know if you've had much chance to look at this um, style. I don't know anymore what we're calling it, the style guide um, that I just was flipping through right here. But um, I think it also gets to what Aaron's saying, it, the scope of this document. Um, you know, as he's saying, how much preface do we need as far as uh, kind of telling them where this fits into, you know, who, who the best audiences may be for those types of things. Um, you know, do we need to get into how much, I guess the question is how much detail do we need to have, you know, pretty much all those sections, all those types of sections, even when you get into things such as um, pre prerequisite knowledge for the lesson, um, those types of things. I, you know, I don't know what, what the appropriate amount of material would be. Or. Okay, so without having looked at it and thought about it much, my my gut reaction is saying on on the front end where, you know, kind of defining the learner and some of the characteristics, I wouldn't get into so much detail because I think that the people who are going to seek this out know that OER Commons exists or do you, you know what I mean? Right. And they kind of, um, what they want is something fast. Mm -hmm. So if there's a lot of text up front, especially about who the learner is, they might get distracted. So do you think it would be sufficient in that case? Like I'm kind of looking at some of these categories that I actually just pulled from OER Commons. When mm -hmm. I put them together, I just I went to their main screen as far as when you submit a resource, what you're required to put. So mm -hmm. um, and so it, even just having enough information as far as like the level, for example, it's a grade level you know, D in math or whatever, would that be sufficient for them to be able to look at it and go, okay, this is what I'm looking for? Yep. Okay. So do you see how, um, and I think Aaron, if you maybe hop over to OER Commons and poke around a little bit, you mm -hmm. can see how those are laid out. Yeah, I, I've looked at them, you know, mm -hmm. some of the, um, some of the lessons on there. My concern was maybe it was a little bit too, um, maybe too much that it might, you know, overwhelm you know, a facilitator that just is wanting really much more simple, you know, solutions or suggestions, you know, maybe keep it to like a, you know, I'm a big believer in one pagers mm -hmm. because as much as you can fit on one page, that might not be a reality, but, you know, you just don't want to overwhelm, you know, the facilitator. They're probably looking looking for the simplest solution they can. That's just my guess. Yeah, I so agree with that. Time I think the simpler, the better. And, you know, I, I mean, I've used templates similar to this, you know, with colleges that had used standard templates and instructional design projects. And sometimes even as the ID on the project, I get overwhelmed with the template. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering how that cognitively affects the facilitator. 
Yeah. Um, I know we had facilitator guides that were averaged 170 pages in our <laughs> adult learning. And um, it just overwhelmed the facilitator to the point where we reduced them to like 25 pages and we got a lot better results. Um, so yeah, that was just my concern, you know. Yeah, definitely. And take a peek because that first section mm -hmm. where it says lesson description, a lot yeah. of those are um, for the purpose of searching. And so they're like, yeah. when you go there, they're like pull down menus and little radio mm -hmm. dial, you know, that you um, yeah. select. Um, so that that's a lot of the first piece, uh, this first section. Yeah. And certainly, I think to your point, some of this may not even be necessary. I'm not even sure all these categories were required and they may just have been available. Um, it's, yeah, it all, it all, it also might be just a matter of you know we make a suggestion of these are some things that you can include, but you know, it's not we're not super strict about it. You know, we're we're suggesting quality, but we want you know to leave the the designer the ability to kind of you know maybe innovate or mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe adapt and adopt. But that's just my approach. I don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I know we're trying to we're trying to you know establish some sort of standard or base for quality but you know yeah I, I, totally, how I, I totally agree and things we need to talk um, about too is like the tags and things that we're going mm -hmm. to use and um, there's a lot of as you're saying a lot of different directions we can go on on some of that I'm sorry did I cut you off Amanda no I was just because I was looking at this um, the standards piece mm -hmm. and while that's you know four bullets I think in reality, when it's fleshed out, if it just says um, CCRS um, anchor, reading anchor standard to level D. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not going to be four separate bullets. I think that that could easily be one spot where you just kind of chunk it a bit. Yeah, and if I recall, that's even a pull down. I think it keeps drilling down, and, and hopefully, <laughs> we were talking about this last night. Um, I'll bring you guys up to speed. I did when I spoke with um, Mindy, our the contact at OER Commons. Right now, everything is aligned to the um, Common Core standards, which again are more K twelve focused, and they don't yet have the ability to map to the College and Career Readiness standards, so the CCRS, and. So the way they're laid out right now with the common core, it's like a pull down. So once you answer one piece of it, like if it's math, then it will then have you give you the opportunity to do another, uh, respond to another pull down. Um, so in, in, in practice, it's not really full before bullet points. It's actually just pull downs when you're working on it. So hopefully that'll be the CCRS by the time we get there. Um, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. I think I cut somebody off. No? So um, how does it sit with you then? Um, I know, again, Amanda, you haven't had a ton of time to look at it, um, but do you like this idea of there being the, the obviously we have to do this descriptive piece just to get it into OER Commons, but um, I guess what we, where we'd really, and to get back to what Aaron was saying too, your help as far as what the instructor guide should include. So if you, maybe you could help us think through that if we, give you some time to actually look at it. But at this point, it was mainly like a lesson summary, thinking through what required resources there might need to be, some of the prior knowledge is required of the student to be able to do the lesson, um, time required. Do you think that's helpful or do you think it's I, I'm over? sorry, I was just talking, but I was on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this prior knowledge piece, I think is key because I, I think a lot of teachers who are in adult education um, don't have formal uh, adult ed education. Back, do you know what I mean? They're not prepared. Um, so I think a lot of times they go into it um, and they say, okay, I'm going to teach main idea. Oh, but then they don't stop to say, oh my gosh, I have to define main idea. And that also means I have to take it back and know that a student has to have a certain level of comprehension to be able to actually get into this paragraph, right? So really, I think fleshing that piece out would be super helpful to the, the end users of, of it. Okay. Um, and then th this lesson overview piece, then this really gets into uh, what you shared with us tonight to, I think it does, the le rather the le learning materials piece. What is this piece again? I'm getting myself confused. Lesson overview. Oh, okay, this is for talking to the learner. 
Um, so, how, Aaron, how does this? Um, I don't know if you you feel comfortable yet enough to add anything to this, or do you want to get Amanda's um, mm -hmm. and the other SMEs feedback on what what we've got what we've started out with to date? Well, you know, Gilbert and I we've been working on our own Google Doc where we added a few components, but then we were concerned that we're just kind of, you know we're just guessing and not really using research and ex you know experience from experts like amanda to really guide our i mean to guide ourselves so i think it would be great if if i could you know get her get your contact information amanda and maybe gilbert and i and you could have a, have a conversation after you go and look at this template i just you know i would feel much more confident having somebody like her help i don't want to volunteer her for more work but you know, are you kidding? I, I, I love this stuff. Send oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. That's I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate your passion. We really want to help. You know, that's what Gilbert and I. You know, we we want to help, and we just don't want to waste our time and spin our wheels, and then, you know, so this is definitely an area foreign to me. I'm really excited that I can learn about this. Um, so I think it will be beneficial for everybody so i do appreciate even your insights tonight so if i could talk to you that would be yeah that would be helpful yeah absolutely um, so it sounds like we're pretty much um going down a path that makes sense amanda do you if we if we uh, um beef up this um learning materials section with the what's it called again the what with the something Whipia. Whipia. Yeah. <laughs> wikipedia so if if that piece is then somehow embedded mm -hmm. uh, within this, this learning material section, it sounds like we're at least on the right path. Um, right, Amanda? Oh, for sure. For sure. Okay. So okay. I will let that process happen then, Aaron and Amanda and sure. Gilbert, who's not with us tonight. Um, sure. And there's Amanda just put her, her email in there as well. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just say, um, you just have to reach out to me in, in writing. <laughs> Because okay. at this, right now, like, I, I won't remember, you know what I mean? And I don't want to make you wait too long. So whatever it is you want to, me to look at and give you any feedback or have a conversation with you right. about, just shoot me an email and then, then I will, I definitely won't forget. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, no problem. Do you feel pretty good with that then, Aaron, that you're on a, you got good marching orders for the next two weeks? <laughs> I'm actually on a treadmill right now, so marching is an appropriate <laughs> metaphor. Um, yeah, um, but no, I'll definitely, I, I actually, I feel so much better that Amanda joined this conversation because Gilbert and I spent about an hour last night talking and just really, I, you know, I was concerned about not really knowing who the users would be. And so this is, this is um, um, comforting to me. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank we're, you. We're, sl we're slowly getting it. Uh, we're slowly, yeah. all of us in higher ed. I, that's where I spend most of my time as well. So I'm, I'm slowly learning myself. Over yeah, and the thing is, I'm months. still trying to, I'm still trying to figure that one out. And I've been in higher ed for, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so <laughs> I'm still trying to figure those learners out because they're constantly changing. You know, exactly. Um, well, so now what I'd like to spend a couple minutes doing is bringing. Um, we've got two parallel design teams going here, and let's try to like have them intersect a little bit. And so, the group we, that met last night. Um, if you look right here, where it says MOOC design prototype. This is what they're working on. And it's a huge document. And I certainly don't expect anybody to try to read it tonight. But um, I'll put a link in also the chat room. So the the MOOC, the 12 week MOOC is now being laid out in a 12 week mm -hmm. um, schedule with eight different modules. And so just kind of cutting to the chase to what where you guys fit into this. Um, if you look at down here, MOOCs modules six, seven, and eight is when the MOOC participants will actually begin developing a prototype based on a design plan that they have done in a prior week. And so then this now gets into exactly what you're developing, um, Aaron, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the template or style guide or whatever it is that we're going to be calling it. So we have a couple um, design decisions we need to think through. How will they be, so first of all, let me go back, I should have finished the, 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 these weeks out. So they're going to be developing this prototype 
And then in Module 7, it will be going through a round of formative evaluation. So we have the um, access to facilitators who will be helping us facilitate the MOOC. So they'll, they'll be, be able to provide feedback. Um, there, the, some SMEs will also be available. Um, and so there, again, there, we'll have the ability to do some, some type of um, formative evaluation, however that mm -hmm. works out. We're still on the planning stages of that. Okay. And then based on the feedback on that formative evaluation, the MOOC participants will then turn in their final deliverables. And as Joe was saying, either they will, we will teach them how to upload it to OER Commons, which is probably the preferred method because mm -hmm. we'd like them to be able to do that in the future, um, or maybe, maybe it would be a facilitator or whatever it may be. So then we have some decisions we need to make, and I need some help from you guys to, to make this all happen. Um, in terms of the prototype, we have to decide should they make this prototype in like a Google Doc, or should they go straight to open author or whatever it may be right within um, OER Commons. And as you can see, I'm kind of leading the witness here. I scratched out <laughs> that as an option. Because once you draft an open author, it actually goes live when you submit it. Uh -huh. And I don't think we really want the prototype to be live. So then we get into some just logistical issues. Um, how do we, well, now we have to kind of make sure everybody has access to Google Docs and knows uh -huh. how to use it and what have you. But there is an advantage to keeping it in a Google Doc. Um, open Author allows you to open up a Google Doc that you've already created and import it into mm -hmm. Open Author. So that step then of creating that final deliverable is pretty easy and pretty painless. Um, so I put you and Gilbert on that week to help me develop the lesson module six. So once we decide what this um, template prototype looks like, then we need to create the lesson within the MOOC um, to teach people how to create the prototype. So this is something we'll work on once we have the, the prototype together. But are you fine with helping me do that and work on that piece of it for the, for the MOOC? Yeah, the MOOC's in Canvas too, isn't it? It is in Canvas, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I have access to Canvas. I Actually, this week I was just moved to the interim director of online learning at my college. Oh, great! Well, no, that's not great. But well, that's sounds okay. great. <laughs> yeah, sounds great to me. <laughs> yeah, but um, so um, uh, I have access. I, I'm I'm the Canvas administrator right now, so I have I can look and see. I think there is. I think Canvas has you know compatibility with Google Docs and Google Drive. And with Dropbox also, so you can, like for instance, my students can submit a paper, you know, from their directly from their Dropbox and from their Google Drive in Canvas. So that's perfect. If you can help me figure yeah, that out. Yeah, let me see if I can. I'll I'll just I can look at it from my from just from our camp from our campus Canvas um, LMS and see how that works. That will be um, great. And you do you agree with me striking out? I I don't think. Again, I'm leading the witness here, but I, I don't like the idea of them drafting, uh, going live in open author, given the fact it is up live on OER Commons once they're once they hit the submit button on their prototype. Yeah, I generally don't like to see uh, any any of my uh, first drafts. I don't like anyone to see that uh, on you know on the internet. So I would think that that would be something we would want to wait you know to go through you know, several reviews, like you were saying, before it goes live, you know. And then, um, and then I think actually what, you, what you're saying, your exper um, exposure to Canvas then, and, and this trying to figure out this ability to, to integrate with Google Docs will help us then on that. Um, and I put Brian in here, and, I, and, and we certainly all can work on it, but I think mm -hmm. I'll um, have Brian help me on this, the evaluation, how that will work. But if, if as you're saying, we can import it into Google Docs, there must it must come in as like an assignment then when we can, um, give it to a facilitator or whatever it mm -hmm. may be to offer the feedback, which will be the subject of the, the seventh module. Um, and so that's when we're going to go through this, this round of evaluation. And I think it would be cool to figure out some way to, to have peer evaluation, the facilitators mm -hmm. obviously sneeze, and then also even have some type of rubric where they could do a self evaluation. Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, how close are they, do they perceive that they're coming to mm -hmm. meeting the mark on, um, on their prototype? Yeah, and Canvas, Canvas has a, it has a great uh, grading tool. I like it a lot better than the Blackboard tool for, you know, the, all the grading, um, the grading apparatus in it. It's, 
it's they, they can put a lot of comments and they can even do video and it's really easy to just click a one button and they can even do video comments in it from what I from what I know I've been okay. doing that with my students so they That's can even perfect. upload a video you know where you know the SMEs and the I don't know the graders I don't know what you were gonna call them but they can even do you know like a video comment which is nice I've been doing yeah. that with my students so well, it'll be interesting to see the numbers. We, we anticipate, well, they keep telling me to anticipate a minimum of 600 students, but I would imagine by Module 7, given normal MOOC, MOOC attrition. Yeah, we're, it'll be down to five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I don't think, it, I, I'm hoping we can maybe eke out, you know, 25 to 30 by the time we're done. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll have to see. So I don't think it's going to be too, it would be pretty much the equivalent of like a graduate level class. Probably. I, I, I can say this, I'm a professional MOOC dropout. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> me too. I'm with you. Um, my name is, uh, my uh, log on credentials are in pretty much every MOOC platform out there. I agree. Yes. And then um, circling back to Joe, um, if you could help me then on this final deliverable piece, as you're saying, you mentioned when we first started, whether that be the facilitator, but I think uh, the more preferred route would be to get um, some type of instruction out there to teach the MOOC participants how to upload themselves so once this MOOC is over and they create other resources they can do this on their um, on their own so mm -hmm. would you mind helping me Joe on that it's module 8 and we certainly don't have to really crunch on this right now because we've got other stuff we're working on but if you wouldn't mind um, helping me on that module I'd really appreciate it yeah absolutely so, um, go I'm, ahead I'm gonna ask a question uh, um, about that so if we eventually want the, the learners to upload their own materials to the repository, so then it, it won't necessarily be vetted, right? I thought, I thought we were gonna have everything in the repository was gonna be vetted by the facilitators. They can um, upload, I mean, I, I, when we were talking about it before, I was speaking specifically to the adult learning zone. I would like to kind of keep that locked down, but if they wanna use the other, um, groups or just upload their own yeah. items within OER Commons, that's fine. I gotcha, I gotcha, okay. Um, and then, so that actually begs a, a question that I have here as well. Are we going to just encourage the use of open author or are we going to require it? Because, and maybe Joe, if you spend some time over the next couple weeks comparing and contrasting what it is to create a res resource within open author versus um, just uploading a resource, they have that option as well, where you just kind of create it separately and upload it as a, a resource. But I kind of like the idea for this, and again, leading the witness here, but um, I like the idea of using Open Author because it it does look kind of like a e-learning development platform, even though it's not robust at all. It's basically like Google Docs, mm -hmm. but at least it gets them thinking, you know, you have to author your e-learning somewhere and here's an example of what is available on OER Commons. Yeah, it does it does offer some pretty intuitive, some pretty neat options, so. Yeah, it is, but it's not like using our, you know, Articulate or anything like that or Storyline sure. or whatever. It's, it's pretty, pretty basic, but. Um, and if I could just jump in on that, uh, sure. this is Amanda, with the, with OER Commons using Open Author, there's um, a tab, um, right when you open a resource that was created within open author that allows you to remix it. So I think that's really cool for the end end users of it because then they could make those modifications that they need for their classrooms and share it. So that's mm, yeah. increasing the amount of resources that are available to teachers out there, which, which I think is really cool. Okay, so you know what? I'm going to make an executive decision. I'm striking through the encourage, <laughs> now say require. So the, yeah. for the purposes of our MOOC, let's just say we're going to push them down the open author path. And if people feel, you know, sometimes people feel uncomfortable about sharing their materials, even though they're getting into this, they might say, oh, well, my name's on it. Um, so maybe when you're teaching them how to use it, you can tell them that they have the option of creating some, you know, different username other than their their real name. Oh, excellent. Okay. You know, like or, or ABD just, teacher number one or something okay. like that. Yeah, that's fine. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and you know what? Um, this is a great point to, um, as I was poking around on OER Commons, 
there are different license options. And mm -hmm. up to this point in our cohorts, we said, you know, we're giving you all of this free instructional support. So we would then like you to have uh, to license your uh, materials as Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some people, to your point, may say, hey, I went to all this trouble. <laughs> I don't want to give my stuff away. You know, what do you think about that piece of it, Amanda? Do you, do you run into that where people are reluctant to so openly license the, the work that they produce? I don't think people are reluctant to attach the open license. I think where they get concerned is the um, for commercial purposes. So, um, but you can still license it. So it's, I think it's like CC by um, attribution, non-commercial. So it's still open. It can still be modified and, and shared, but I can't take it and make money from it. And I think that's where they feel uncomfortable, the money piece. Yeah. And see what we, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we pretty much, we, we remove the commercial piece of it because it gets a little gray area if, um, say, for example, Grace Centers of Hope starts teaching um, for a fee. They don't, but <laughs> that was our prior client. Does that preclude them from, you know, that was always kind of the gray area. Does that preclude them from using non-commercial? Um, no, it doesn't. Material? So that's where we kind of, so we kept everything very yeah. open. It, does, it doesn't. It, it would just preclude them, preclude them from creating a workbook or something and then selling it to their students and online. Selling the workbook yeah. selling the versus yep. selling the class or whatever. Yep. So. Yep. I mean, because a lot of times, um, I know in higher ed, that are because there's a lot of higher ed using OER, um, they charge a materials fee because they still have to make the copies. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not, that's how they kind of get around that in a loophole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, excellent. And then um, I think we're about done. I, we did go about five minutes longer than I thought we might. But um, as far as competencies and um, entry competencies of our MOOC participants, we're kind of making the assumption that they're going to be able to use Google Docs, that they're not going to have any issues using OER Commons. Does everybody agree that's pretty, and I guess, Amanda, your input is, is pretty crucial here. Um, do you get a sense if we get a lot of the ABE instructors that join our group, it won't be a bridge too far to ask them to use Google Docs and to use Open Author. How do you think that will work? Um, I can't speak too much for Google Docs, um, but I, um, I would say it was about like a 60-40 split with all of the teachers I've worked with um, in Open Author. Some just wanted nothing to do with it. Others really struggled with it, but they have tutorials on how to use it. Um, and then, you know, like the majority of them were fine, but there was certainly a group that needed a lot of hand holding. Okay. Like Aaron said. Okay. Okay. But you think it's a, it's not, um, it's not too much to ask that they try. <laughs> no, I don't know. Okay. No. And I think you have this template so like you're you're telling them what to plug in in a certain order and I think that that will probably alleviate um, some of the the fear yeah and, and what's your, yeah. you're right so if we kind of handhold them through that prototype phase within Google Docs assuming that that isn't too too tough for them then there is that button you can push to pull you know to draw from your Google Doc right in there so you don't even have to copy and paste it just kind of that looked that I did that a couple different times that was pretty slick um, to pull that in. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with my agenda. Does anybody else have any questions before we uh, adjourn for the evening? I was just going to ask real fast um, about that, what you just finished talking about with the Google Docs is, um, I guess, is one of the expectations for, for the attendees to, um, to have a Google account since we're, they might be using Google Docs? Yeah, we got to think about that. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so is that, a, do you think that's a big deal to ask all, all your MOOC participants to have a Google account? Well, I don't it, know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something to think about. Like, I guess that's one of the advantages of uh, OER Commons Open Author is they, they wouldn't necessarily need to have an additional login to, right. to access it. Okay, let's think through that because it is, it, it, it definitely was, I think I even had that up there in my con. Can we assume everyone has Google Docs? Yeah, I did have that up here, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that because it, it, we, do, it, you know, for these cohorts, it's been really interesting. Most people have no trouble getting on our 
things, but we're also in education. <laughs> we also mm -hmm. um, probably have our students use Google all the time. So we aren't really the the norm, probably. Our school, our school's email is Google. So yeah, yeah. Same I mean, I know at Northeastern that's what they use too. When I did my doctorate there, they they their email was in Google. So. Okay, love them and hate them all at the same time, Google, right? Sure. <laughs> they own <Sure>. us, <laughs> but, sure. but they also give us a lot, too, I guess. So. Yeah, and they're, I guess they're watching every document we create, too, so. <laughs> exactly. Shooting them into space, so exactly. who knows? Well, I guess if we had some people that were really opposed to it or, you know, didn't yeah. want to, they could still create a Word doc or whatever, and we could work with it, work with that, but. Um, yeah, or somebody could upload it if you wanted to share it into Google, you know, the docs, yeah. but then they wouldn't have access to it or or whatever, so. Yeah. Yep. Good point. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everybody for joining, Amanda, for joining. I appreciate it. And as soon as we're done here, I'll just fire off a quick email so everybody can exchange emails. Um, all right. Well, thank you. And we'll see you in two thank weeks. You. Um, unless everybody, that way that worked, I think for everybody, right? The 12th. It's seven. yes. Okay. Very good. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. you. Too. Good night. Bye-bye.